life in here is kind of cheap. People uh, can sit there and hurt somebody for just the smallest of reasons. I've seen guys get themselves killed in here for a box of cigarettes. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Mom. Don't worry about your kid. He's all right. This joint is a keg of something, man. The whole department. You know what I said? We got word out here today that they sent a letter to somebody and told them they're going to tear this mother down. Now, I'm letting you know something. It scared me, man. I am afraid. As long as they have San Quentin, I think you're going to always have violence. San Quentin is a, is a scary place, you know, and when, when inmates uh, come here, almost without exception, they're frightened people, and frightened people behave differently. Frank Hauser, Lang, Smith, Lowe, let's go. First day I walked in here, I, I thought somebody had made a mistake. And I said, where am I? You know, I've done a lot of time previously. And I wasn't used to coming in an environment like this. Two people got killed here the first week I was here. I did seven years flat in New York in Attica. And uh, no one got killed, guard or inmate. There wasn't any stickings. God knows how many people have been killed or stuck since I've been here. I've been here going on six years now. But in the first seven days, two people were killed here. We do have a high concentration of violence-prone individuals. These guys are crazy. Or well, some of them are nice, too. <laughs> San Quentin is the oldest and uh, largest of the 12 male prisons we have within the system. Uh, has many, many, many years of history and tradition behind it. It's got a bad reputation and it tends to live up to its reputation. People, as soon as people drive up to this place, uh, they feel they have to get a knife or they have to protect themselves. Uh, they have to become a tough guy. It's an attitude, it's a personality in itself. <laughs> well, I certainly hate to be in this type of an atmosphere, caged up like that, you know, this, with those cells only four and a half by eight. There's not much room, and these guys, the majority of them are locked down all day long, you know. That's all day, just to come out for chow, once we're off a canteen. The whole thing is based on the man's behavior with inside prison. If the man can adjust to the to prison life and, uh, to, and conform to the daily routines that, and uh, trouble-free, that he's given the opportunity to come and live in the West Block. The only remaining honor block within the prison today, formerly there were two honor blocks, the North and the West, but due to the great influx of violent type people within the institution, the only honor block left is the West Block. This block here, uh, the bars are unlocked at 6.30 in the morning and you're out to 10.30 at night. Uh, the only time you lock up is for count time. It's 5.15. The rest of the time your doors are open, you can do what you want to as your cells, as you see here. And uh, we get a little privileges like being, being able to have cats without getting them picked up by the security squad. Uh, a little bit free run. You can be able to go to uh, different institutions, different areas in the institution. And if you're a West Blocker, you can go there without much problem. This is my world. I grew up in it. I know it inside out. I know what to expect. Um, it's my frame of reference. You've lived on the streets. Um, when you walk out of your house in the morning, you make automatic decisions that uh, you don't think about, whether you're going to go on a bus or what you're going to do as far as change goes. And uh, even the minor purchases and things that you make through the day and your constantly facing people that wear different types of clothing, that have different points of view. Um, you live in a, a very competitive manner uh, in some ways in the fact that you're always ready to defend your own view and you don't even think about these things. In here, when I walk across the yard among 2,500 men, I see nothing but people in blue. In general, I know where their heads are at. I know um, pretty much what their stories are going to be after I talk to them for three or four minutes. And it's a, it's a life that I'm as at home with as you are with your life on the streets. For me out there, um, it's a constant pressure to uh, 
at least give the appearance of conforming. And I don't understand the streets. Um, I got physically ill the first time I faced a crowd after I came off the road. Uh, I couldn't handle it. There was too many different people, too many different views. Um, Gee, has prison done this to you? Yeah, sure. Or is it yourself? Or no, it's, uh, I know a lot of guys that are. They don't. They won't talk about it that much, but they don't want to hit the streets. You know, I mean, uh, they've never made it on the streets. They don't know how to make it on the streets. They go out for a vacation, but they know when they go out, they're coming back. You know, um, this is home to them. You know, they're institutionalized. Uh, the state is taken all the initiative away from them as far as running their own lives and knowing how to run their own lives. Um, and here you sit back and uh, major decisions are made for you. You don't make your own major decisions in here. Um, you have a you have a rent provided for you. You have a home provided for you. You have your food provided for you. Uh, medical care. Everything's provided, you know, and uh, the only thing that they ask of you is to do what they want you to do, to conform, you know. And uh, after you've been conforming for 20, 25 years, it gets to be uh, pretty easy to do, you know. Uh, when I was young, I rebelled. I spent most of my time in the hole because I didn't go along with the rules, you know, and uh, I fought the system. But now I ride along with it, and I find it rather easy to ride because... Uh, I'm in the honor block, you know, I have my own possessions, uh, not a whole lot, but uh, they're not insignificant either, you know, for me, they're, they're much more than I ever had before in my life, uh, I never had anything on the streets, I couldn't afford anything. This time, my second time loser, probably 27 years old this month, and uh, lost everybody. Mom's died when I was in the prison last time. My father uh, more or less disowned me this time around. I read my brother's letters and never received any answers, and it's just me and him and the family, and it kind of hurts, you know. I can see where they're coming from, you know. I've been a pretty big disappointment. The only one in our family that's ever been in trouble, and you know, I'm in and out of jail. And, uh, they told me last time when I got out, you know, if I ever fell again, I could, this is what I could expect, you know, but you always tell yourself, nah, you know, they won't do that. Revolutionist and terrorist, gun runner, hitman. I was sentenced to death at the age of 19. I was three hours away from execution when Governor Knight commuted me to life without possibility of parole. I've been here since. Actually, I think I'd rather be executed. I'm, I'm walking in Death Valley now, man.
got my shoes on, that covers a couple of them. I've got nine brothers and five sisters. And I was tired of living out of a garbage can. You know, I had a, to survive, I had to eat out of a garbage can. And I used to see kids better dressed than I am. And, and I said, well, that's for me. So I joined the East Los Angeles gang. And, I pushed the dope at 11. I was a drug addict at 12. By the time I was 15, I joined an organization called the Tumbareros out of Tijuana. Gun running. We used to steal guns from National Guard armories. Any place we could get them. Burglarize them, pawn shops, and sell them. But then I got tired of getting picked up and pushed around by the police, so that's when I became a revolutionary. I blew up police station just to be blowing them up, and just for the fun of them, just to get back at them, because I had, I had too much hate in me, you know. I ain't got that hate now, you know. I, I'm an old man now. This block is about the worst block in the institution, I'd say. The worst uh, mainline block. This is where most of the stabbings occur and, you know, the fights. And, uh, well, anyone who was busted on the outside who was uh, given a, what we call a beef, a disciplinary. Uh, if he gets busted from an honor block, he ends up here. So, this is the end of the line. East block is, uh, well, we call it little Vietnam around here. Two months ago, we had a stabbing on the third tier, it's between black and white type thing. And the stairways is a good place, this is where they usually do it, you know, because they're kind of hidden from the guns. Well, as the commanding officer of this block, what do you observe to be the effect of incarceration on an inmate? Well, take an animal for instance, you know, you keep an animal caged up or a dog chained, you know, they become kind of uh, hostile and uh, we're all very unfriendly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, no, we're all, I mean, animals. They make criminals here. The situation here is pretty hopeless. Um, that the smallest things that a free person can give is highly appreciated. For that reason, the teachers are um, respected and maybe even loved a little bit. Um, <laughs> But uh, uh, during the lockdown, I might, I might find that I'm giving some man a, a copy of a, of a novel that I pick up free outside a bookstore that throws it out. And for that, uh, uh, I'm a good guy on the blocks. I felt safer walking through East Block with, with so-called rapists and, and all kinds of, of, of criminals than I feel um, in lucky markets, you know, where I don't know who I'm dealing with. But generally speaking, uh, convicts, I find, uh, give you a chance. Uh, they give you a chance to be a human being. If you, be, if you behave humanly, um, you, you're pretty much in. If you, if you, treat, a, if you treat a person uh, viciously, uh, you can get away with it here because the men are in chains. Okay, in the Adjustment Center, many of you probably already heard, Gibson had a piece, refused lock up, personnel went in after him, flak vest, etc. Uh, Howard was hit twice in the arm, minor injury. Officer Howard. Officer Howard, that's correct. Sergeant Marrero got a scrape on one of his hands. Officer Sanders got a slight graze on the, uh, one of his hands with a knife. No one serious injury. Gibson. That's Gibson. Gibson was then taken to the hospital, placed in the psych ward where he is now. The psychs feel that perhaps he was mentally deranged at the time of his acting out behavior. That then, as I see it, would preclude the possibility of DA prosecution. Anyone have any questions, comments, criticism? <laughs> Shut up. Anectine is not the uh, proper name of the drug. It's uh, 
There's a, there's a word for it that has something like 24 or 25 uh, letters, but uh, for short, they call it a neck team. And what you do is the officers in the green shirts come in and they put you in restraints, handcuffs, and they put shackles on your feet where you can't kick. And the doctor comes in and he sits down with a little folding chair, a little metal folding chair. And he says, um, well now, Mr. Smith, you burnt your mattress last night. Why did you do that? Well, it so happened I burnt my mattress because I had nothing else to do. I had no books of uh, any kind whatsoever. I had uh, no type of, uh, nothing to keep my mind or anything else occupied except staring and looking at the ceiling. So I decided to do something, cause a little excitement, and I burned my mattress. So he says, uh, now we don't want you to do that again, Mr. Smith, so we're going to try and give you a little therapeutic drug that will help you. It's called a neck team. And I want you to listen to me very carefully when I administer it. Naturally, I have no choice in the matter. I'm chained and restrained and have two or three people sitting on my arms and legs. I can't do a damn thing about it. So he pulls out a hypodermic, and swabs my arm, injects the nectine intravenously instead of intermuscularly. It goes straight to the vein. Immediately upon injection, your body goes into a um, convulsive, just spasmic, uh, say four to five seconds, a spasmic attack. And then the body's immobilized. Uh, it's a feeling of being suffocated with pillows on your face and at the same time of having an enormous amount of weight on your chest where that you can't breathe. It's a feeling of uh, total uh, paralysis of your hands, your arms, your legs, your toes. You can't move anything. You, you can move your eyes slightly, but only slightly. I mean, it's very hard just to move them a fraction of an inch either way. It's, uh, it it uh, totally mobilizes the body. It's, it's like a catatonic type of state. And, uh, but of course, it's uh, a limited state. But your, your, your thing is this, the doctor understands what he's doing to you. He knows that you're not going to die. You don't know that. You may think, as most of us thought, as I personally thought, that he put too much in there that, I, that he'd kill me accidentally. Uh, I thought that perhaps maybe the sadistic son of a bitch had did it on purpose. I didn't know what he was doing, but I knew that I was dying. I had no, I had absolutely no doubt in my mind that I was going to die. And he said, now you're not going to do that again, are you, Roger Dale? And uh, naturally you cannot talk back. In order to talk, you must be able to get air. And you can't get air in the sense of the word that you can breathe like we're breathing now. Uh, you're living on the uh, oxygen that's in your lungs and the oxygen that flows through your lungs and the pores of your body. But it's just enough to sustain the blood flow to the brain such that you don't lose consciousness, but that you feel the total effect of, of, a, of a death sense. And I've been close to death many times. And you can believe me that that is perhaps the closest feeling to death that I've ever experienced in my life. And uh, he consistently just consistently drives into your head, you're not going to do it again, are you? Now, you wouldn't want this to happen to you again, would you? Uh, as you would talk to a child, a six-year-old, eight-year-old child, and uh, the effect of the anectine itself wears off in about three minutes where that you get partial movement. Well, during that partial movement, they, re they remove your restraints and they get out of that cell because uh, after five or ten more minutes, you're going to be able to have full movement of the body. And believe you me, if they were in the cell at that time, you would gladly kill every single one of them and you wouldn't think nothing about it. You'd think nothing whatsoever about it. My understanding of anectine and the uh, gas treatment that they administered was simply for traumatic effect to, uh, effect to uh, create trauma in your head where that you'll refrain from doing something that they consider against the rules, something that they consider a violation of the rules. But the, uh, the trauma is so severe that instead of you saying, well, I'm not going to do that again, yes, you say that. I'm not going to burn that mattress again, or I'm not going to break that wall again. But what you do plot, you say, now how can I get a hold of something where I can kill one of these son of a bitches? This is what you start plotting. So you forget the petty minor stuff, the, uh, get rid of the uh, aggressiveness, the, the pent-up hostilities by burning and making noise and breaking things. You do it because you are afraid of the anectine. You are afraid of the gas treatment. Anybody says they aren't, they're a goddamn liar. 
but you start planning on how you can assault severely, preferably one of the people that administered this to you. But in actuality, anybody that's in a position of authority, that has authority directly over you, that you can retaliate against and say, now, son of a bitch, if you do this to me again, I'm going to get another one of you people. This is how your mind works. This is how my mind works. This is how many of the men that I lived with on S3, this is how their minds worked. The Adjustment Center is the area where inmates uh, are secluded from other inmates. They're kept in individual cells most of the day. They're, in, they're there for a variety of reasons. Some because of violence, violent acts in the prison. Others uh, because of dealings of drugs. Others because they have been victims of attack and they're in need of protective custody. Others because they're just really afraid to go on the main lines. We have a variety of, of inmates there. A few of them are mentally ill, most are not. And uh, I'm there as a psychiatrist uh, to do a variety of things. And I, f I find it quite interesting. It's a depressing situation being within here because you only go out to the yard maybe two or three times a week and uh, like I say you know guys got a little six by eight cell here and uh, you know it's it's even worse than, than uh, what a dog would uh, have to be living under and um, anyway the medical conditions haven't they're, they're nothing all they do is just give you a few suppressants you know just to kind of knock you out and uh, keep a man happy they give him a few uh, um, stimulants, you know, just what they think a guy would be, uh, you know, happy with. In other words, uh, that would just pacify the man, but it's not, it's not medical treatment because they're not uh, examined by medical staff. Well, they're locked up 24 hours a day where they can't get out and go to uh, movies or uh, have TV sets and that type of stuff. Uh, all they can have in here is their legal work and magazines and books, and they do have an earphone for a radio, and that's about all that they're limited to. I've been trying to expand the program that's available here, but of course, Department of Corrections is always short of funds, and it's, I haven't been able to get any funds to pay instructors other than the one that we have. So I have been working with volunteers. I have a, an art instructor from College of Marin who comes in from time to time and looks at their artwork and offers suggestions, and I have a yoga teacher who also is a volunteer, who comes in a couple of days a week and is offering yoga instruction to those that are interested. Inmates in general are interested in keeping fit and the yoga exercises are just you know, another way of doing that. Plus it, it may relieve some of the anxiety and tension. There's no more emotionalism in the ACs, for example, since they're uh, in cages all the time than out in the yard? Uh, well, you see a little bit more of it in the adjustment center, like uh, inmates throwing food and and stuff on the officers, which they wouldn't do out on the main line because uh, they would be locked up for it. And here they are locked up. They have nothing to lose for it. What do you do with your leisure time? I uh, a lot of reading or uh, just talking. You know. It's you know it's uh, if they'd have more exercise and uh, a little more. Uh, how can I say it? Uh, Little things you could make in your cell and stuff, you know, that are, it might ease a little bit of your, you know, your pressure and stuff, instead of looking at the bars or looking at the calendar, because I don't get it. How long are you in for, Jeff? Uh, well, I got a date right at the present. You got a what? I have a release date at the present. What's your release date? Uh, 1980. 1980? Yeah. So, but I already lost that, so don't. You lost that because of going to the AC? No, I lost that for throwing water on an officer last week. They have uh, tear exercise, which is an hour each day, but you only get that about once a week because there's 17 people on the tear, and that's 17 hours, you know, so uh, you won't hardly get that but once a week or once every two weeks. There's no man, convict or cop, or counselor or free personnel or anybody else that has been in this adjustment center longer than myself, nobody. There's nobody that knows this adjustment center better than myself. There's uh, been no man in California history that served longer in the whole, and when I say whole, I mean segregation, isolation, uh, where that you are confined in a segregated unit, longer than myself. 
Other than 17 days, I've been confined in the hole for eight years and seven months and 14 days right now. And anybody that is in that adjustment center, yeah, right now ain't got nothing going for them. And I mean nothing. They're dead as far as the world is concerned. As far as this institution is concerned, they're buried. I don't know how to put it in words, you know. I just don't know. Man, uh, these bulls, they shot me. Uh, this dude, he didn't even fire no warning shot, you know, and he just shot me out in the yard, and uh, you see the bullet come out about an inch under my heart? And uh, he's trying, he's supposed to shoot you to, just to maim you, you know? But uh, he, he shot me, and uh, dude was trying to kill me, you know? They've been shooting people like that a lot lately, though, because they just shot a black dude in B section, uh, and they shot him in the stomach, too, you know, and they're supposed to shoot you in the leg or something, you know? But uh, they, they didn't do that. Either. Right, and you shot another uh, white dude's eye out down there, too, with a shotgun, you know? That's what they be doing a lot lately, you know? They said it's supposed to be a deteriorant to uh, violence, but it ain't. A strip shell is, is, a, is a cell which uh, it doesn't have a sink in it. Uh, the toilet is, is removed, there's a, there's a the hole in the floor for a toilet which is flushed from the back of the cell. There's nothing in the cell that the inmate can rip apart. Uh, the mattress is put in there, it's fireproof, it can't be set on fire. Uh, the inmates are not supposed to have matches or cigarettes back in the stark with. Um, everything is watched real closely. Uh, I say the inmates that like to be back there is uh, some of them just like uh, like to stay back there. Uh, I don't know why. Ask them. You might call it the black hole of Calcutta. There was absolutely no light in the cell whatsoever. You were fed a ration of uh, so-called RD restricted diet, which is a loaf of uh, minerals, vegetables, and. Uh, they say all of the daily proteins and vitamins that you need to subsist, but it tastes like sawdust and it's frozen, and you have to wait till it thaws out before you can eat it. Uh, remember now, we're speaking of the years of 65 and 66. Yeah. This is when this decision came down. So uh, after being placed in there, I stayed in there for um, eight and a half months in the strip cells, and I uh, mutilated myself uh, severely in my arms, uh, my chest, uh, I cut my own self with Ajax, tops of Ajax cans, razor blades, pen filters, uh, anything I could get my hands on in order to get out of the hospital. Can I raise up here? Sure. There's several lacerations with razor blades all the way up the arm, starting from the wrist and running to the joint of the arm. Mm -hmm. In this uh, joint of the arm, I've severed the artery uh, three times. Uh, there's what they call a uh, plastic tendectomy in there, which is uh, pieces of plastic to uh, replace veins that were cut out with razor blades. And the same thing with this arm all the way up to the joint, same thing. And the reason for that was uh, to try and obtain a uh, transfer to the California Medical Facility, which is a psychiatric facility. And it was more or less a... Uh, uh, sham. I wasn't really crazy, but I was willing to do anything to get out of that strip cell, uh, even if it meant seriously destroying uh, my health, my arms, uh, scarring my body or whatever. When you say real fear, I think anybody who walks into a prison uh, feel some apprehension. If he doesn't, he doesn't understand where he is, what it's about. And baby, <laughs> when you see what this place is like, you can't see what it's like by having people talk to you or nothing. You have to live here. You have to have those doors racked in the morning and walk out hoping that you're going to make it through that day. Because everyone here lives in fear. There's a different value system here in the prison whereby it's, it's okay to kill someone under certain, in certain situations, such as if that person has killed a friend of yours or a member of your gang, you're supposed to retaliate by killing them. Or if that person owes you a debt, it may even be for just a few packs of cigarettes, it's okay for the inmate peer group to kill that person. You know, it's just a different value system. San Quentin is a reputation place, like, you know, and everybody here has to more or less have a reputation, you know, in order to survive here. 
you know, like a guy that usually come in and try and does his own number, uh, it's kind of hard, you know, and that's where your, your gang type of uh, things come up. Now, only, only a small percentage of the inmates really espouse this uh, different value system actively, maybe 10, 15 percent of the population. The rest of the population are somewhat terrorized by the small percent at this time. They're afraid to speak up against it. They're afraid to try to control these inmates. The only way they could control them probably would be to become violent themselves, and they wish not to do that. So that the 10 or 15 percent that are violent, that do belong to these gangs, uh, are able to pretty much uh, run the prison. See, the guy doesn't know Kung Fu. He hasn't fought for five or six years, and he gets thrown in the middle with all these lions, and there's just not somebody there to shelter him. It's like maybe he does the, the homework, but the other guy does the fighting. Well, he's totally lost. He'll be, he'll either become a homosexual or he'll be used and abused. He'll never probably be able to face a woman again in life. He'll never be able to live a normal life by having children like other people. So he has to go to his, he's white, so naturally he would go to the white group. The violence centers around a couple of things, one being narcotics, uh, the tra traffic in drugs uh, that's in the prison, the illicit traffic in drugs. Another being homosexual activities. Uh, certain inmates are homosexual, of course, and, and they, from time to time, are fought over by the other inmates. Um, those are the uh, two main causes. Another is just to fight for territory, you know, want to be king of the mountain, uh, want to run the prison, run whatever, you know, racket there is uh, to run. We'll see how the black guys have got a whole lot of dope this, this, this month, okay, the white guys want some. If you don't have a a group to confront them with, or something to deal with them with, well then you don't get any of the narcotics. I mean, they just control everything. If they're the stronger group, they would control the best part of the movie, they would control all the trades, they would control the part of the yard for exercise. They would just have total control. See, people aren't indiscriminately running around in here with knives, sticking people for no reason of all, at all. Any more than they're dropping bombs in Vietnam or any place else. Things are done for certain reasons. And that's the same in prison. You got people in here that have disagreements and everything else. They have debts the same as anybody else. They have emotional problems the same as anybody else. And they have one way of taking care of them, unfortunately. On the problems? Yeah. One, one thing mainly on them problems, you just get pushed so much just at one time, it blows everybody's bomb. They just, they, they just don't care. They don't care about the guns, don't care about nothing. Just blow it. And no one plans nothing like that, you know? Yeah. I think because what do you got? You got like a you got like a pressure cooker here. Now, uh, yeah, what 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 they try to do here is call a lockdown to keep uh, problems down. That just build more. Tension. It builds more tension. I've been in these blocks and what they call climate controls to try to uh, feel the, feel out the institution, the attitudes. Is it going to be a problem tomorrow if we open this place up? Well, when you go into some place like East Block, man, you can cut cut the uh, tension with a knife in there. Guys who were saying, well, who's got hit today? Or who, are the blacks doing this? Are the whites doing this? Who's doing it? Or get me a shank. Because they're afraid. They're locked up and they're cut off from the rest of the institution. So lockdowns do cause problems. I think they, I think they should find out what the problem is, deal with the problem, open the institution up, and, and just not punish everybody. Prison punishes everybody. If one guy does something wrong here today, maybe tomorrow 500 people are going to get punished for it. <laughs> There was a Pearl Harbor type attack on black inmates by some Chicano inmates and uh, right now the situation is so tense that I don't think there's any way we can safely release the general population. The only way we're going to keep peace among them is just not allow them the opportunity to get at one another. We know the mafia, you know, was involved, you know, we know the mafia initiated the action, you know, but... You mean the Mexican mafia? Mexican mafia, yeah. 
um, see, they've, you know, they've been, um, they and, the, they and the blacks have been at odds because of a stabbing that happened last week, you see, and they've been talking about it, you know, trying to, the different leaders have been talking, trying to kind of quiet down, you know, supposedly, you know. So evidently, uh, the Mexican Mafia decided that uh, you know, they were going to get down first, you know. Yeah, well, you know, it could have been me too. You know, I could have been in the same position. It just so happened that uh, I happened to be in the hospital on a ducket when that happened. But I seen the guys, I knew one of them, you know, died. You. But uh, There's nothing really you can do, uh, you know, really uh, to alleviate the fear that everyone had, uh, you know, of what response, you know, is the blacks are going to have, you know, that's, you know, because, uh, you know, they, you know, two of them are dead, you know. What's the mood right now coming from uh, where you see it? Uh, pretty tense. Uh, I find that as I walk through the tears, that uh, a lot of the fellows are pretty frustrated and uptight, and also that uh, there's just uh, a lot of mumblings going on, a lot of things that are... Uh, it kind of point to the tenseness of the whole situation. How do the blacks feel now? Um, I've only talked to a few, but uh, I hear rumblings is all I'm hearing, but those are rumors, so I can't uh, uh, tell. Uh, the guys just hate to be locked up, that's all. All this retaliation, people are building this up into a big thing, like it's a great big race war. There's only certain people involved. It's not the general population. The general population are in their cells hoping they could get out. Like you stated, you know, there's just a few that are causing the trouble. But how can you, how can you pick out those few, separate them from the mass, and let the mass go about doing what they want to do? At this very moment, the thing that's being done is we, everything is at a standstill. We have uh, every inmate locked up with the exception of a handful who are out uh, performing necessary functions like hospital workers, uh, food preparation and such. Well, all it's doing is delaying it, really, because, uh, you know, if, if these guys are going to get down, they're going to get down. That's, that's the dilemma, you know, because we have to do something, you know, because it's very serious. Uh, right now, this whole institution is like a powder keg, you know. Everyone's so quiet, you know, and that's, no one's really raising any hell. Everyone just scared, you know, and that's really bad. The weapons you see here have been picked up around the prison on various times. Some of them are made out of conventional items, stuff that you'd find in a machine shop or anything. Uh, various stabbing instruments there. They tape the ends of these so that uh, it makes it extremely difficult to get any fingerprints to identify the man using the knife with the knife. And how about this here? Down here we got bombs. They make bombs out of match heads. This one down here out of pipe will show you the explosive force that can be generated by uh, just match heads. Sometimes they'll use things with pieces of glass in it, sort of like a uh, shrapnel device. These two items here are darts. They can uh, get a piece of conduit some way or another, a uh, half inch or three quarter inch conduit with a nail and uh, with a paper and a little glue, which is not hard to come by, and shoot these things and they'll drive them uh, through a half inch board with just the wind. There's no problem at all. And uh, to show you the total extreme we go on weapons, you see the bone up here. It looks like a t part of a T-bone. I have never s seen, although I wouldn't say it hasn't happened, any incident involving a bona fide uh, knife of this nature that, uh, you know, came from the kitchen or came from the other thing. It's the things they've found have usually been handmade things that uh, they made out of a piece of scrap iron or, or something of that nature. Some more things with, that are more conventional tools, a screwdriver that's sharpened here on the end. Uh, this uh, was probably a bolt, and as you can see, it's sharpened on the end. A measuring rule that someone got, which is very hard steel, and it's sharpened on the end. Is that a machine gun? Uh, I'm not sure if this was made in, uh, and used in an escape attempt here about six or eight years ago when uh, two people overpowered one of the maintenance men here, one of the free maintenance men, and uh, took off out the west gate. This probably could be a zip gun, and this is the, maybe the firing pin that uh, would work into it, which uh, you just, it's a one-shot affair, and it uh, is uh, very deadly, of course. This looks like a spear. Uh, yeah, it does. I pointed with a uh, 
a toothbrush, a toothbrush. So you see a, a, a harmless looking thing like a toothbrush can be a serious weapon. Over here on this side is a garrote. This is to go around someone's neck and choke him very nicely. And uh, that's the end of that. This is very soft. Uh, there's no, it feels like there's buckshot in there. Uh, very good blackjack. Again, no fingerprints and no marks on the person uh, to speak of to identify the type of instrument that did it. And you can see you can make a hacksaw out of anything. Adjacent to that, we have some ropes and uh, looks like some inner tubes, some more ropes, a rope uh, bundle there with a hook to go over the wall, a package with uh, road maps and probably other clothes, a saw, a shovel to try and dig your way out, a mask to leave on your bed so the officer thinks that you're still there. Beyond that is a key that will hook up to an automobile so you can steal it and steal it on and off, and then another shovel. Along the top of the thing is another rope spread out that they've made out of sheets to get down off the wall. The escape mechanism means that people want to get out and the pictures show what happens if they don't. You're charged with Director's Rule 1104, Counterband. The specific act was possession of two prison-made stabbing instruments. You can admit to the charges as written, admit to the charges with modifications, or deny the charges. I deny the charges. Uh, I ask for a lie detector test and a physical examination in order to uh, clear myself of the charges, but uh, I haven't had any response there, you know. We don't, we don't normally uh, give a lie detector test. Uh, and this, if this late data wouldn't well, be too No, good. this is a serious uh, yeah. thing right here. It's, it can cost me uh, an additional year or two, you know, well, of my time. Okay. Well, I was only in that cell for three days. Okay, yes, that's was one of my next questions. We, we want you to you know, give us some idea of what well, you know I, about or how it got there. You know. I come from uh, the Adjustment Center. They moved me from the Adjustment Center uh, March the 28th. Uh, at that time, uh, they ran me through a metal detector and a skin search and a squat search. I got to a... Uh, B section and they ran me again through a skin search and placed me in the cell and uh, I didn't have any property so you know I didn't really have any reason to go through the cell. You, you this, this very happened on March of 31st and you moved into that cell on March of 28th. Right. <coughs> Did you look the cell over when you moved in? Or you, don't you make that a habit? Or? Well I didn't have any property so I didn't really have any right. reason to uh, go through it. Having, having been in prison um, three years about, right? right. You're aware that, right. that you're responsible for everything that's in your cell. I'm responsible for what I know is in my cell. Yeah. If I don't know something's in my cell, I don't know how I could be held responsible yeah. for it, you know? See, we don't know that you don't know what's in it. Well, that's why I requested a, a, well, a light detector yeah. test or a physical examination of some type, anyway. What do you mean by physical examination? A rectal examination. They well, said I was supposed to have a keister stash. Well, that, that's again uh, because they found the human feces or what they thought it to be, but that really, the charge is really the possession, and they weren't found, they're not saying they were in your rectum at the time they found them. You know, that, that as far as I'm concerned, we're not even considering that last sentence there. All we're concerned about is the knives in a plastic bag in your cell. If they move me from one place to another place, well, that cell is supposed to have been, you know, uh, been gone through prior to me, my arrival, right? It had been. It had been. It had been. Well, if it had been, then uh, evidently the officer who made the search didn't make a, a very thorough search of the cell. Or it wasn't there when he searched it. It's a possibility too, right? No, that's not a possibility. Well, it is as far as I'm concerned. Yeah, you know, I don't know. You know, I'm, I'm gonna. I, okay, that's why I requested these tests. See, uh, that that's what I stated in my uh, 
to the investigating officer is just my word against the evidence, right? Yeah, we know one was one fact. No matter what you're saying, there's one fact. One fact is there was two knives right. found in my cell. Right. You the second fact right. is your response. Well, I agree, sure. Yeah. But, you so, know, I'm not denying that okay. the, if the officer says he found two two knives in my cell, well, uh, I'm not denying that. Were you there at the time? No. When he found them? I was down in the shower area. Usual procedure, they, they, they shake down while I'm in the shower yeah, area. I know. Or take them out of their cell. You wouldn't normally be there. Have you ever had a, this kind of a charge against you before? No. Want to step outside? We'll call you right back. Okay, Kelly, the committee discussed this, and uh, it was a consensus of the committee that you were guilty and responsible for what's in your cell. I mean, the only real fact we have is they were found in there. But we're assessing your 10-day cell status effective today. I'd like to uh, also tell you that you have the right to appeal. Yeah, all right. Within 10 days. Okay, here's your copy. Kelly? Kelly? Sure. Okay. There are many different reasons why people commit crimes and, and why persons may be violent and most persons are not that are violent are not violent most of the time they're only violent for short periods of time and most persons that commit crime that's only one aspect of their lives um, for many different reasons uh, ranging from lack of education lack of opportunity to do something else lack of uh, practice in doing something lack of uh, proper job skills and work habits so many prisoners come from families that did not encourage things such as education and productive work and uh, none of that they associated with delinquent peer groups uh, where the value systems were uh, not those that are held by general society also many suffered a lot of deprivation and, and with their families they were mistreated by their families and so they have a lot of built-up anger at this and then they project the anger that comes from the family situation onto society in general. And, uh, there are others that are mentally ill. We have perhaps uh, 15 to 20 percent of the inmates in the Department of Corrections are seriously mentally ill. I think some of them need psychiatric care. Well, they don't belong in here. And I guess, you know, the state just doesn't have the facilities or I don't know. This is home right here. <laughs> this is home. You're home away from home. Right, home away from home. I was railroaded on three murders in Oakland. You probably are familiar with my case. What is it? You from the Bay Area? Yeah. Yeah, wait. Well, you familiar with the, uh, the Piedmont Slam, the son and the mother? The Piedmont, they, they was from Piedmont? Yeah. That and then some uh, call out man. But uh, I was railroaded um, on all three of them. Yeah. I got life without. Every time I walk down this hallway, I feel that some part of my life is being taken away. You know? And I feel that when I'm walking down this hallway, I have to watch my life. And this here puts a lot of tension on a man. When you first come in, or from what people know about it, it they, they're afraid of it. You're, you know, you're just completely afraid. You watch the back, back of you, the front of you, the sides of you. You don't know uh, who to talk to and what to say. So you keep to yourself most of the time. It's not monotonous. There's something different every day. I've never had the same kind of a day twice. I don't believe I've ever had a day that I've worked uh, for the department that I disliked. I like my job real well. I like the men I work with, both the convicts and the officers. What's in your line down here? Come on. Oh, give me a little slack. Give me a little slack. You got it all. This is what you do if you want to get something. <laughs> oh, but no, shit. 
If we're lucky, we have a mirror that we can check and see what's going on outside. Otherwise, we just look straight ahead all day and uh, we end up with nothing. Hey, man, check this book out, man. Um, I'm a first termer and a last termer because this place done convinced me that uh, once you're in here, it's, it's hard to get out. It's easy to get in and hard to get out. So I'm advising anybody uh, that's out there, if you're doing something wrong, you better do it cool and don't get caught because if you come here, you, you're going to see the real life here. This, this is a cold place here. year and a half. Could you have more if you wanted to? Sure. But uh, I told him uh, not to come, you know. How come? How come? Uh, there's no sense in him coming, you know. Um, I'm all chained up all the time, you know. Hey, there's dudes in here that can't even relate to their own mother when they go out to visit them in that, in that visiting room out there. Hey, and it's a heavy scene, man, seeing a guy sitting there at the table with a big smile on his face, holding his mother's hand, and don't even know how to talk to her. Man. Because he, the only thing he knows is San Quentin, you know? And he says, Mom, how's it going? How's Dad? How's Sis? You know, uh, how's, how's my brother? You know, what? And that's it. That's as far as it goes. What can they say? Oh, they're doing fine? Or uh, so-and-so sick in the hospital? Then he feels bad. He's on a bigger bummer than whenever he went out there. Well, I get visits uh, maybe every three weeks, maybe once a month. I don't really like them, you know, so close together because you run out of things to talk about. Well, even a visiting, you might get a visit. And uh, even though you haven't done anything, they're not involved in narcotics or any other thing that um, they might be looking for, you no know, kind of escape plans. The pig that's in the visiting room might not like you, the way you carry yourself, the way you comb your hair. So he would say, well, I want him to shake this guy out when he come back in. You know, I think he got something. 
So you go inside, they take you in what they call the receive and release. Then they tell you to strip, okay, just strip to the bare nudity. And then they tell you to, uh, you go through all the changes of run your hand through your hair, look in your ear, open your mouth, raise your arm, bend over, spread your cheeks, turn around and raise your testicles, turn around and raise your right foot, turn around and raise your left foot. All these kind of, you know, changes that uh, serve no purpose whatever because, like, a lot of people who are just trying, and just in that prison, trying to get out as quick as they can. And these kind of things, I've seen these kind of things channel into something where the brother might resent this and say something, you know, that if he'd really been thinking, he might not have said it in the beginning. So he says something, you know, out of total respect for himself and angry at being totally disrespected. And this could turn into a brutal beating from the, you know, eight or nine pigs. This is where all your violence and your bitterness come from. Because there's no real it's reason. It's transforming a, a man, a human being, into a, some type of animal. All this, this is what this represents to me. It's the only place in the world where human beings are shot indiscriminately for a fist fight. You know, and I'm sure that anywhere people ought to be able to understand, anywhere men or women, you know, congregate, there's going to be disputes that's going to lead to fisticuffs. But that's the only place in the world where human beings are shot and killed for a fist fight like 1970. They killed three righteous comrades of mine. Just blow them away for fighting. And it was ruled justifiable homicide, you know, by the so-called judiciary system in this country. And they give their families a tokenism sum, you know, and that don't compensate the fact that those people's sons are dead because some trigger half of God, you know, shoot in the yard. They kill a comrade of mine, 61, Booker, shot him down. They shot another comrade of mine, shot his testicle off, fist fighting. No weapons, just two men selling a dispute. They shot him six times each. What do you do about people like me and a lot of other people that's, uh, you know, that being in prison, you know, don't you can't don't nobody know how it is in here, you know. Otherwise you can talk to them all day and never understand, you know. But I understand, I know everything. I've been to all the max security holes. I've been I've been the A C four A, I've been the B section, I've been every max security hole they've been, I've been there. And you know what? I haven't seen a change yet in prison. All I've seen it get worse and worse and worse. I watch it every day, you know, and I ain't got you know, like I say, I don't live on pity, you know. I'm like I said I'm always going to be strong regards to, you know, what I'm going to do, which, like I said, like I went to the board after 17 years, and you know what they tell me? They tell me that uh, I don't have a place, a job, or nothing like that. What do I suppose to have in 17 years, you know? I was 13 years old. What do I suppose to have? You're state raised, huh? State raised. But you know what? Uh, <laughs> but, you know, like I said, it's not my fault, though, you know? I'm intelligent, I got all my pride, my identity, you know, but just like they say, they say why well, I like to, uh, besides like to fight a lot, stuff like that. Why do you fight? Well, because well, I got a, they say I got a quick temper, but you know, uh, fighting sometimes, you know, it's just something, something to do sometimes, you, know, you know, like I said, you can't take a bunch of thousand people and crown them up and expect them to all be friends, you know. Sometimes people do get, you know, a little drove up behind that, and then uh, next thing you know, uh, <laughs> And there's two doors popped open and uh, someone gets hurt, you know. And that's just about... What do you mean two doors get popped open and someone gets hurt? Well, sometimes there's two doors racked open instead of just one like it's supposed to be. And, and this happens quite quite frequently if you check some of the records. You know. mm -hmm. two, two prisons are allowed out at once. No, there's only one person allowed out at once it's on the tier. But sometimes there's a mistake and two there's are allowed mistake, out? Yeah, there's a mistake made and there's two people out. Who's at, who's, who's at fault for making that mistake? Uh, well, there's only one person that runs the bar box, and it's not a convict. Most attacks, or most violence, are provoked not through inmates alone, but through staff. And that, that is my profound belief. For I'm not concerned with St. Quentin at the end of the world. Like in 67, uh, when they had the uh, uh, uprising, which was a, a black thing only. One of the pigs stuck his finger in a black comrade's milk. So out of that, the blacks decided they weren't going to go to work. So the pigs tried to turn this into a race incident. They start picking out white comrades, take them to B section, and agitate them, saying, well, the blacks get ready to attack you. They arm themselves. Consequently, they put all the whites down in the lower yard, and all the black is on the upper yard. And they went down there and indiscriminately shot a lot of white, a lot of white comrades on there.
And you're talking about these bulls. It's a few bulls in here that fruit of foxy, eh? but there are other bulls in here just like the other policemen in the streets. Nothing. They're incapable of dealing with men. They don't know how. I saw a murder up there on the yard and in front of a bull. Thank God I'm before this camera to say this. On the May the 16th, Lewis Brown got killed. I saw it. My name is Benjamin Gerald Brown, B8660. I saw a man walk up behind another man with a bull standing up on the tower with a gun at parade rest and took and watch this man and take his life. I've been in the system 20 years. I'm a personnel barber. I lost my respect for every bull in the joint. That's right. I did. I've seen it. I, I would take a razor and work on that neck. I've never nicked a man in the, in the joint. And I saw that. Had I been out there, I definitely would have been afraid. Because those officers are up there, and they're up there for a reason. They're not up there with those guns just to look pretty. They're up there to protect me. If you had the opportunity, would you escape? No. Period. There is absolutely no way I'm going to go out there and come back looking like a lead bottom sieve. Whenever the highway patrol got through with me, they wouldn't have to bury me. I'd sink into the ground. Not because I would be shooting at them or anything else. It would just be simply because I'm in here for killing a highway patrolman. And the animosity out there, I figured they got their chance. And it was the right position, whether I was armed or not. Escaping with a, the fact that I'd been on death row, first degree murder, killing a highway patrol officer, I wouldn't have to dig no hole, I'd just sink below, below the ground. Bubbles, if you had the opportunity, would you escape? No, at this point, I would have when I first came in, if I had the chance. But escape now, it's too late to escape. They've already taken all this time, they might as well take the rest. The two crimes that I was convicted for are very, in my eyes, hideous. And uh, at the time that uh, they, I was arrested for these two offenses, which involved the uh, deaths of two elderly women, uh, made me just, you know, so uh, sick and, you know, just bitter and, you know, heartbroken, sad, whatever you want to call it. In fact, I just blew it in the courtroom and just, uh, <laughs> I just uh, attempted to hit the judge, I mean, excuse me, attempted to hit the DA, threatened the jury, and, you know, stuff like this. And my whole outlook and, uh, at that time was very negative. The fact is, uh, now I'm here on Convent Road because of uh, my attitude, not, not the evidence. My name's John Ray Diaz. Uh, I just turned 19 and uh, I'm in here for murder. My little boy just turned uh, two years old, uh, November 24th, you know, and uh, I was really down and out because of that, you know, and uh, I had my birthday in here and uh, had my anniversary in here, you know, and. Uh, you know, I haven't, I haven't touched my little boy in the whole year, you know, and uh, you know, I've been locked down almost the whole year, you know, and uh, I mean, it's just kind of weird, you know, and uh, like uh, they give me medication here once in a while, you know, when I'm down and out, you know, like when I get all depressed, you know, and then I just take, you know, a couple of volumes or whatever, you know, to calm me down, go to sleep, you know, and forget about it, you know. Well, how would you feel? I don't know. Being locked up in a cage 24 hours a day, you know, not much exercise and uh, constant <laughs> thought going through your mind, you're going to be executed. Even though I receive the death penalty for killing a man, I don't believe anybody should be dead. I don't believe anybody should be killed. I don't believe that anybody should have the right to take a life or to impose that sentence on anyone. Yes, I feel that the method of execution by gas is a very cruel one for the people who are witnesses to it, and uh, it's, it's a very unpleasant thing to have to watch. And I think that alternatives might be something as abrupt as blowing a person's brains out, which while not as too pleasant to look at, is uh, not really as uh, ugly overall as watching someone die in the chamber or perhaps a more peaceful method such as uh, injecting with an overdose of narcotics. I favor the retention of the penalty only because it's the only proven cure that we've been able to come up with uh, for people who are involved in multiple killings. The other alternatives that we have developed I wouldn't care to be a party to, such as turning a man into a vegetable through a lobotomy 
or planting electrodes in his brain so that when he feels a homicidal urge, he can push a button on his belt and maybe have an orgasm. Uh, to me, these kinds of things would be robbing them of their humanity, and I wouldn't want to be a part of that. I'm here for what is called multiple murder, two murders. I'm also here for robbery, and I have three special circumstances allegations. One which is robbery murder, the other one which is supposed killing of a witness, and the third is for the uh, two or more is mass murder. Each one of these separate special circumstances merit the death penalty. Who was Tony on the outside? Oh, well, Tony on the outside was a totally different person. <laughs> so, Can you tell us a little about him? Well, I was born and raised in San Francisco. I lived in the Mission District of San Francisco, which is the middle-income area. I was working at the time. I was... Uh, it's just your normal working man. That was about it. The family? No, I wasn't married. I was still living with my parents. And uh, just uh, sort of Mr. Inconspicuous. It was just uh, never. Uh, well, I don't even really know how to put it. I was never involved in any kind of crime. This is the first time I've ever been arrested no prior juvenile record. So this is a completely brand new experience. And uh, I always, it's sort of ironic now when I look back, being that I was a member of the Republican Party on the outside, that I voted for the death penalty myself when it was on the ballot. Because there's not too many people on death row that voted for it. The man's name was uh, Pierce, and uh, he uh, got pieces of a broken light bulb from a light fixture that was in the cell, uh, just adjacent to the gas chamber, and slashed his throat with a piece of it and uh, nicked his jugular vein. And as the blood was spurting out, of course, the doctor said that uh, we're going to have to hurry up or he'll beat the state. But of course, you can't advance the time fixed by the court for an execution. But they did hurry the process of getting the man seated in the chair and strapped down, and uh, then had the door dogged and everything ready to go. And in the process of hurriedly strapping him in, one of his arms worked loose and flailed around, and as the blood was spurting from his throat, it hit his hand and his wrist, and splattered all over the interior of the chamber. And the witnesses outside were fainting faster than the officers who are normally posted there to catch the one or two people who might fall uh, could even make a move. And of course, when they spun around to see why everybody was fainting, they nearly went down themselves. <laughs> In life, uh, I, I'm eligible for parole in 1980. Yeah, I, I don't look to go anywhere to about 82, 83. That seems like a long time. Huh? Yeah, well, it's a long time if you uh, look at it. Uh, I, personally, my personal opinions, I don't think that uh, a lot of time uh, rehabilitate nobody or do nothing for nobody. I think if, if you send a person to a madhouse like this, it ain't gonna do nothing but make it worse in the long run. Uh, I kind of agree, I forgot this guy's name, but he was trying to introduce a bill for no crime to carry over five years. You look at it, if a man is going to rehabilitate or repent or change his ways, it definitely don't take no 13 or 14 years to do it. Don't do nothing but embittering, make him, you know, make him bitter. Now, I've been assaulted and stabbed more than anybody in California history. That's the reason they say that 
I'm Pin Cushion Smith. 109 stab wounds, ball bats, horseshoes, uh, straightened up, pico pico bottles full of soap, uh, gasoline bombs, uh, fire bombs, zip guns, uh, all types of things. But at the same time, I've done these things to other people. I've killed men, seven men. I'm 27 years old. I've killed seven men. I've assaulted numerous other men. I've hurt, I've uh, raped other men. I've, I've uh, assaulted staff, convict, all type of things. I've done things too. So can I say, you know what, I'm blameless, man. I'm just an innocent little old victim that got stabbed all up and stuff. Or do I say on the opposite hand, look, man, I did my share of wrong. I received my share of being done wrong. So I'm going to stop this in the hopes that it will stop being done to me. Now, in my case, unfortunately, I've gone past that point. I don't, I don't really have any hope one way or another of getting out. For me, I came in young. If they would have gave me that modified indeterminate sentence and sent me out six months or a year, more than likely I'd be a liar on the streets now in a sense that's my, uh, my uh, you know, choice of professions. But uh, because I'm not, because they didn't see fit to give me a date to work toward, uh, you see my result. You see what kind of man I am. What you see now is the, the men coming out of the industrial area, the furniture factory to be exact, they're being what's known as skin shook down whereby all their clothes are removed and there's all the clothing in their bodies are searched for contraband coming up to the main yard into the cell units. And they place their clothes in a box. The box is passed, the officer searches the clothes, another officer searches the body. The, the uh, box is then passed back to the inmate free of contraband. The inmate then puts his clothes back on, proceeds down here, goes to another metal detector, and then back up to the upper yard and awaits lockup. factories we start the men off at five cents an hour. They go up to 25 cents an hour and they'll have a few, very few, that meets, reach the maximum of 35 cents an hour. But the average runs from 18 to 20 cents an hour. Pretty rough, you know. Yeah. But the trade itself, I've been coming to uh, to like this, and uh, I think that once I get to the streets, I'm going to stick with it. Yeah. Do you get paid for doing this here in prison? No. You don't get paid at all. No, they have what they call uh, three pay numbers in here. The lead man, which is uh, Buck Lattimore, he gets paid. The guy that works the uh, slices get paid, and the guy who works the freezer get paid. I think they make ten dollars a month. Ten dollars a month. Yeah. It's because a man's in prison doesn't mean he's not going to be going out to society again. And uh, if they can help the man get a job and stay employed, uh, it's going to help, help his chances of not returning. And uh, 
I think these people are just concerned about that. I want to see these guys get a good start. Most people working in these vocational training programs are down, supposed to learn a trade. That when they were supposed to be rehabilitated to come back outside and get a job. And the bulk of this work is these trades are for one thing only, for maintenance. Maintenance of the prison itself. Not only the prison itself, but also for the warden's houses, captains, lieutenants, and people who live on the reservation. These are what these trades are basically for. Baking, cooking, they only do kind of cook for themselves, they cook for the prison guards. You know, they cook for the officers, their wives, and their friends who come out to the snack bar. The convicts can eat in this place, even though they are, are forced to do the, the labor, the cooking, the baking, the dishwashing, and what have you. With the five cents an hour that they get, they've got to buy things that you and I would consider absolute necessities, such as toothpaste, in my case, cigarettes. I, I hope you don't consider that necessity. And, um, know. you know, well, uh, writing paper, you name it, anything. Uh, my job at Scope is like an employment agency. Uh, we interview inmates that are at parole and try to process them and try to gain employment for them. What makes you stay with Scope? Uh, I really, I really enjoy it. It's, it's. Uh, I couldn't find more interesting work. I'd love to do this on the streets. I wish I'd done this before I got here. If I had them, I'd not have gotten here. Uh, what are your plans when you get out? Uh, I'd like to follow the same line of work. I think I'd like to stay in employment or in the union work. What do you plan to do the first day you get out? Well, I've got a sentence of life with no parole, so uh, it's a little hard to plan right now. Well, I think when you ask whether one could have a prison system of which one would be proud, I'd say no. But I do think that there are reforms worth looking at. But the only reforms, in my view, worth looking at are those that are advocated by the convicts themselves. You always have to look at the person at the bottom of that heap, you know, to see what kinds of reforms do make sense. It's interesting, for example, that in the uh, almost nationwide thing going on now, uh, you know, this cry for building more humane and modern prisons, better prisons, the convicts who live in those squalid hovels that you've been showing in this film, those horrible cells, have in no instance endorsed this kind of reform because they know only too well that the criminal justice system being what it is, um, more prisons will just result in more prisoners. They'll fill up the old prisons and they'll fill up the new ones. And in places where brand new prisons have been built, and there's quite a few of them, this is precisely what's happened. So I would say no more prison building. Watch, watch out for the reforms the prisoners want. The prisoners in California say, don't give us a shiny new hospital. Don't give us steak and eggs for breakfast. Get rid of the indeterminate sentence. Get rid of the adult authority. That's what they say. And I think to find out their reasons for that is important. I know what I want out of life. I know what I want to achieve. I can't do it in here. And all that is, all that door out there is doing is barring me from the streets and achieving my life. All right, I put myself here. And, and the way I put myself here, first degree murder, you know what? All right, you know what? I own up to it. You know, I know that I did it. I, you know, I can't fight that. I can't tell people how I feel inside about it, how I hurt, you know, or the remorse that I have, you know, or, or how sorry I am that it happened. But man, it's done. And, you know, if I'm to be punished, you know, fine. Tell me, hey, man, you got to do the rest of your life in a penitentiary. That way I've got no future, except for a penitentiary future. But I know where I stand. Give me something that I can work towards, that I can fight against, and I'll better myself to overcome that barrier. But when there's nothing there, a man has nothing to progress with, nothing to build himself up, to gain something in life, he feels like nothing. He needs to know that someday he's going to get out so that he can plan his life as such, so he sees a future.
That society out there done created a monster they don't know how to tangle with him. That's what it is, man. San Quentin, in the first place, was never designed. It just happened. You know, cell blocks were built, they ran out of space, and they tacked another cell block on here, and there's a building there, and it's a maze way of corridors and alleyways. It's just ill-designed in every respect. San Quentin is a huge monstrosity. This prison is so big, with so many little nooks and crannies and areas, that it's really difficult to operate efficiently. And that's one main problem we have, just efficiency of operation. Uh, nothing seems to, to work out the way it should. It's, it's difficult to influence a large population when, when they're so spread out, as, as is true at San Quentin. I would like to see a smaller prison, or a prison where you could have separate areas where the staff could get to know the inmates personally, and the inmates could get to know the staff. So you wouldn't have just uh, uniforms running around, some green, some blue. You would have individuals relating to each other, and then you might have more opportunity for the inmates to est establish a good working relationship with the officers who presumably have more healthy, adaptive values uh, than the inmate group, although that may not always be the case. That's one thing I, I think is wrong. Another thing I would like to see change is more emphasis on education. Uh, we have an excellent education department, but like everything else at San Quentin, the budget is very small, and they are not able to completely satisfy the interest or the need that is here. I think if we, they had more teachers, more money, more funds, they could expand their educational activities, teach a lot more trades, teach a lot more things, and you would see a lot more positive change in the inmates. Because uh, everybody in here is not a criminal. Really? Everybody in here is a convicted felon, but not necessarily a criminal. Ideal settings? I like the camp system myself. Uh, in a camp system, you have between 60 and 120 men, usually 80 men camps. Uh, they live in a dorm setting. They go to work uh, in the morning about 9 o'clock. On the road, they clear roads, they clear streams. They work with the fish and game, they work with the highway department, they fight fires all during the summer. They work a six day a week and uh, quite a bit of freedom. Your camp limits are usually about a half mile square. They've got ball fields, weightlifting areas, TV areas, pool hall. Most camps have a swimming pool. And uh, to me that's the best, the best system we've got. Uh, when I was in the camp system, I had guys in camp that came from right here. And a lot of the guys that was in camp with me are right back here now. So, you can have your violent men in camp, and they can make it all right. They're a group of people that our society wants to put away, keep away, and keep out of sight. And if we would have justice equally applied, so that there would be the same percentage of middle, uh, low and high income people in prison, you would see a greater improvement in our prison system because you would have people in here who would, uh, who would be fighting to get those improvements. Right now we don't have it, and our society doesn't want to uh, make the improvement because it costs money and therefore, you know, our, our rockets are more important than our men in prison. People in Sacramento and uh, in Corrections and we working here at San Quentin, I think we'd all like to see this place closed because it's far, it's just, it's antiquated, mm -hmm. it's old and it's tired mm -hmm. and, and uh, it doesn't, and we've, we've gotten old, you might say we've gotten old and tired and short-sightedness too uh, because of the place. I feel that San Quentin could have a lot of improvement due to the fact that See, it's environment what makes things tick. See, in this environment, it's outdated. It's an impossible place because it's so old. It's just a, it's a bad scene because there are too many people in too small a space, and it's just a very difficult place to run, a very difficult place for inmates to live in. The best thing I can say for San Quentin is that uh, it should tear it down. Everybody in the business, the inmates, everybody knows that the place ought to be blown up and get out of there. Right. The times are changing, you know. And people are going to change with them. But 
the uh, San Quentin, man. It ain't gonna change. It just ain't gonna change. No way. The only way they're gonna change San Quentin is when they flatten it to the ground. And that is a gospel <laughs> truth. And you can say it over and over again because walls in San Quentin were built in hate. <laughs> they stand in hate. And there ain't a bit of love. And the world don't go around on hate alone. Because where there ain't no love, there ain't no understanding. And where there ain't no understanding, there ain't no compassion. And when there's no compassion, you got a prison. And that's San Quentin. The presentation of this program was made possible by a grant from the Corporation for Public Broadcasting.